The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash YCF860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Thank you for attending this session. We are delighted to have you here. It is, it is an honor to, um, to have good friends as well as um, new friends uh, in the audience. So, so we hope to have uh, an exciting and very interactive session. So we do hope to, uh, to see your questions. Our session is uh, Insights on Innovation in AML, uh, Precision Diagnostics and Novel Treatment Across the Spectrum of Care. Um, my colleague, Dr. Daver Naval from Hemonc, and uh, myself from MD Anderson will, um, will um, lead the discussion and the presentation. Today we'll focus on um, high-risk presentations in AML and how to inform uh, treatment decisions and make difference for our patients. So this is an overview of the diagnostic milestones of AML. The CAP, the College of American Pathologists in 2017, also provided guidelines for this on the strength of evidence. Please read about it. It is becoming a quite uh, intense cycle of communication between the Hemong teams. We meet mm -hmm. at least every week on Thursdays with uh, Dr. Naval and, and his team, and we get feedback. This one has changed the way we treat. We have a familial clinic because we are detecting more and more germline uh, mutations in AML, so that has changed the way the flow cytometry works, and so uh, as, as well as the way we involve the genetic teams on this. So this is a classification of AML based on the 2016 update, and notice that um, uh, several things happened. So the uh, AML with mutated NPM1 and some of the AML with uh, wrongs one were sometimes hidden under the myelodysplasia related changes. Now they are listed as uh, provisional entities in the case of AML with mutated wrongs one. The AML with mutated NPM1 used to be a provisional entity. Now it is a recognized entity and we will show some features associated with this. They used to present with uh, myelodysplasia related changes but now those morphological features no longer um, uh, you know, compromise the diagnosis of AML with mutated NPM1. AML with BCR able is now included as a provisional entity because it can be targeted by Glivec and other compounds associated with um, uh, good responses in these cases. And notice that the category of AML with related neoplasm is decreasing. In addition to that, I was, I was telling some of my colleagues in the WHO classification that if we could capture the AML with A21, immersion 16, and APLs with PML RADA, if we could capture 100%, if you and I can identify 100% of them and never miss them, we will have a major good for mankind because that allows us to cure them. Dr. Diver has specific protocols for this, and they present sometimes with multilinear dysplasia. You have seen Tim Lay in JAMA not more than about two years ago showing a case with uh, multilinear dysplasia that was sent to St. Louis for transplant that had a F3 mutation, complex karyotype, but it had been missed on an APL, mm -hmm. a, a, a PML rara, never forget that it can present with severe dysplasia. And so, so you have to um, remember that th this don't follow the 20% rule, the A21, the, uh, the, the inversion 16, and the PML rara, don't follow the 20% blast rule, and therefore they are being missed. And so I, I, I believe that the CAP also has identified this as a major opportunity to, um, to cure this. If Dr. Um, Daber sent us a patient, um, they, we normally receive them we get about 60 marrows a day. We do a differential count, 500 cells on the bone marrow. We release the, um, the blast count, and we tell Dr. Daver the patient has 60% uh, blast, and the blasts are myeloperoxidase positive. That gets released online to the clinic chart within 30 minutes. So basically, it's a preliminary diagnosis mm -hmm. that the case has AML. If the myeloperoxidase is 100% myeloperoxidase positive, we immediately do immunofluorescent stain for pod, and if the fluorescent stain is positive, it will appear in, the, in his chart as a blast are also um, pod positive, so you will have the microgranular pattern, and so they, they will initiate ATRA. 
So we do this at midnight, we do this in the morning, it's offered 24 hours. At the same time, they take the smears and they take it upstairs for fish. Cytogenetic fish will, will fish them for the uh, uh, 1517 and the fish will be ready the next day. With the automated systems, I think every time a case comes, we do the, the, the stains and at the same time, three smears go up. They are smears for fish, for BCR able, because Cantarian doesn't want to miss a BCR able leukemia. Okay, so the fish is always done, uh, especially if it's eosinophilia. Um, and, and if you suspect that it has myelomonocytic differentiation or butyrate, we always immediately trigger a core binding factor, uh, either um, in version 16, and that will be ready the next day. By Thursday morning, they will, the result will be already released in the chart. Um, the, um, the rest immediately, the flow cytometry panel is being done, a scatter is being provided, and the next day, the flow cytometry is ready as you are dictating the case. Uh, molecular studies, it gets a preliminary screen, and it has a screening for the actionable mutations that you will see described by Dr. David. In this age of advanced state-of-the-art tools, don't forget to get a peripheral blood smear and to review and re review information related presence of EPO or color stimulating factors that might um, change your blast count. These are some of the traditional and new prognostic factors in AMLs that you know. And uh, the most important one also is related to treatment responses and headaches that now we're seeing as we're seeing differentiation effects on some of the blasts and trying to count the blasts in the, in the presence of FLT3 or IDH treatment, which is making this a challenging uh, for some of the morphology and uh, this is an evolving need. And I think I, I will ask Dr. Uh, Daver to, to comment on this. Do you wanna comment on the blast count as you see it on, from your clinical perspective? Yeah, sure, so thanks. Uh, I mean, I, as you said, we get the initial read, a prelim differential usually very quickly within a few hours. Um, that's helpful, but we usually don't make any treatment decisions uh, based on that, and I'll and you'll talk about, and I'll talk about why. Uh, so that's useful, but I don't make a decision based on the blast in the bone marrow. Okay, so you use the clinical data. Right? Well, yeah, clinical data, and of course, most important is fish, uh, molecular, mm -hmm. uh, and cytogenetics data for us to decide treatment now. And okay. I'll, I'll show you some of that in our slides. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here's a case uh, of a lady, a patient uh, presenting with um, a history of uh, low uh, risk MDS, intermediate one at age 65 um, in 2013, treated with ASA for 19 cycles. Uh, four years later, uh, developed progressive anemia and thrombocytopenia. The lab results uh, confirm that. Uh, what test should you consider in this setting? Uh, bone marrow aspirate, bone marrow biopsy, flow and next generation sequencing. Um, the additional tests uh, show that the bone marrow was hypercellular, that it had 55% uh, blast, the flow cytometry show aberrant myeloblast, the immunophenotype was consistent with AML, uh, now she's having TP53 mutation and ASXL1 and complex karyotype. So now this MDS has evolved into an AML with myelodysplasia related changes with complex karyotype and mutated P53 and ASXL1, and that's usually the way we normally integrate in the diagnosis. So Dr. Daber will discuss what mm -hmm. the treatment options will mm -hmm. be. Yeah. So um, at this point, sometimes we're doing P53 IAC, immunohistochemical stains, if they're gonna hit, depending upon the targeted therapy Dr. Daber is using, uh, you know, we do IAC for P53 and, and then can follow them by, by protein. And also we are doing BCL2 in case uh, of an etoclax treatment so that we can follow the, the down regulation of the BCL2 protein. So remember the, the diagnosis of AML with myelodysplasia related changes required 20% 20, 20 or more blood, multilineous dysplasia, excluding uh, cases that are de novo AMLs with mutated MPM1 or cases uh, with de novo biallelic mutation or CVP alpha a prior history of MDS, such as in our case, or a prior history of MDS and PM, the presence of myelodysplasia-related cytogenetic abnormalities, except that the WHO removed the deletion uh, 9Q, and so that no longer is showing up in the table, I will show you that in a second, 
and the absence of recurrent genetic abnormalities. This relates to the issue that I was highlighting for you. Please don't lower your guard that you may be missing uh, uh, an inversion 16 or a, uh, an APL. Um, and also, Dr. Diver will provide for us history, uh, prior history of cytotoxic mm -hmm. therapy or radiation treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, these are some other examples here by Dr. Weinberg, illustrating a case where the marrow aspirate is, was bad, it was fibrotic, but the biopsy was very helpful and it highlighted the increase in blast. Um, the multilineage uh, dysplasia, as well as um, uh, peripheral blood that could be sent for cytogenetics. And so, in this case, the cytogenetics in her report showed that it had minus 7 and deletion 5Q. So, if you have a failed um, aspirate, a biopsy is very helpful. Touching prints can also, could also be sent for fish. I have seen that with MLLs too where the marrow is fibrotic and you have an imprint with ugly looking monoblasts that are not seen in the deep, and then you fish them for MLL and bingo, they, they, they show the abnormality in there. So, serogenetic um, um, abnormalities, a complex karyotype, three or more abnormalities. However, note that about 78% of cases with myelodysplasia related changes do not exhibit a prior history of MDS. Um, the, the, the presence of unbalanced abnormalities, such as the one listed here, and then several uh, balanced abnormalities. So now let's switch to FLT3, uh, mute and AML. Uh, this is Carol, she's 49. She has some um, symptoms, easy bruising, gingival bleeding with uh, fatigue. Her uh, CBC shows leukocytosis with thrombocytopenia. 69% blast with nuclei with thumbprint appearance. Mm -hmm. Here is the um, uh, aspirate and, and, the, and the morphology. Um, additional tests that were done included aspirate, biopsy, karyotype, and molecular profiling. So the biopsy again show aspirate 72% blast and the immunophenotype was myeloid. There was a maturation with cytoplasmic peroxidase present. Karyotype was diploid. But it had triple hits. It had now FLT3 ITD uh, with an allelic ratio of 0.89. It had MPM1 and DNMT3A. So this is an, uh, an AML uh, FLT3 mutant. Uh, and these ones have been reported by the group, uh, the European groups actually, also some of the inhibitors, that the ones like this with uh, diploid karyotypes that have these triple hits they actually differentiate. So there were two patterns, the, the, the um, differentiating pattern and the cytotoxic pattern. And the ones that were deployed cytogenetics and had these triple hits, they differentiate, differentiated. So that you can see that the marrow continues to be hypercellular, right, it's not empty, but you can see that the blasts are now switching and to a more uh, left-shifted myelocytes, metamyelocytes, uh, and you can see that also by flow cytometry. So these are uh, just to remind you of the, the NCCL, uh, NCCN guidelines, and I believe you're going to touch on those. So yes. I'm just going to briefly emphasize this, that you have to be constantly monitoring this case. In the previous case, you saw that the FLT3 mutant remained the same, but the, the patient was responding. It was differentiating. So um, several markers are also being uh, recommended, um, including CKIT, FLT3, ITDs, uh, TDKs, MPM1, CAVP alpha, IDH1 and 2, and TP53. The mapping of the molecular assessment across time shows that you have a mosaic, and you need to have a dynamic assessment of this, and actually you need to be constantly communicating with our oncologists, so that's why I added this 24-hour, 24-7 kind of day, where uh, at least um, in our practice there is a 24-hour timeline to communicate constantly of whether the patient had achieved uh, remission and whether they had remained in remission and, and has uh, uh, per, re retained the chip abnormalities, such as in, in pathway number one, where dnmt 3 a the two ASXL, which remains uh, in the chip. And it's important to put that it is a relapsed AML um, so, that it, uh, so that it qualifies for some of the clinical trials right. that Dr. Daver will discuss. Or it may show persistent disease, uh, but it's one that you can actually manage with IDH2 or IDH1 inhibitors. This is 
the um, AML uh, assessment, my MRD, one of the early publications by Jorgensen and Dr. Ravaldi uh, uh, several years ago. And, and you can see that this is basically uh, versus normal. Uh, basically, you use this uh, where normal areas where you don't supposed to see a population within CD38 and CD34 and, and or uh, CD13. So finding areas that by flow should be empty. The, the son, Dr. Jorgensen called these sacred clean sites. So find a clean site that is not supposed to be contaminated. And in, I call it contaminated, but in there, those are good readouts for you to follow up um, where the MRDs or the, the clones are emerging. So some of these are still, uh, from the molecular point of view, the ELN uh, suggestions for molecular timing are at the time of diagnosis, after, those, after two cycles of induction yeah. therapy or consolidation treatment, and at the end of treatment. And I, I think we will see more elaboration on this. So look what happened for the AML with the younger adults. Notice that the intermediate group, one and two, has basically collapsed. And they basically, the adverse, are you good news or bad news? The goal is to try to reduce the intermediate because Dr. Diver can't tell too much to the patient. For the bad news, you can see that it has uh, now the 922 BCR able is there, but they also added mutated P53, mutated ASXL1, mutated ROMS1, uh, uh, wild type NPN1, but with high FLT3 ITDs. All of those are now moving this to a you know, a patient that is in the adverse risk group. And then they're cleaning back the, uh, the core binding factors, and within the core binding factors, there are another level of molecular changes that allows you to see who's going to respond and who's not going to respond uh, based on um, some of the uh, usage of some of these. So this is one of the, one of the cases that we saw with Dr. Konoplev, um, a 22-year-old patient of Dr. Konopleva. And he had this morphology, and I thought he will have an MPN1 mutation, and indeed she did. The surprise was that it was also pH positive. So, and she had no history of uh, previous CML, normal counts, well documented, no splenomegaly. To make a long story short, she had uh, no other, the, the molecular pattern was more that of a de novo AML. Uh, it, did, it never had ABO1 mutations, it didn't have a complex uh, karyotype with a lot of pH positive clonal evolution, such as you see in blast phases of CML. So this was one of those de novo AMLs that we saw. And it goes with the uh, clinical presentation of desusplenomegaly, no, no peripheral blood basophilia, and, and lower uh, bone marrow cellularity with M ratios. So that patient was treated with actually in a combination of, um, you know, um, yeah. HM immunotoplex. Correct. Um, she's doing great. Um, the AML we mutated, uh, wrongs one. The WHO is recommending that you use the, this for deployed cases, or de novo cases, after you exclude uh, other specific subtypes, such as secondary AMLs uh, and evolving from MDS. They're asking you don't contaminate this group. Try to keep it clean for the time being until we understand uh, what we are dealing with. If you do so, um, you will see that they tend to be in older age. Um, and, and male predominant and immature morphology. And there is data now being published, mm -hmm. I believe, mm -hmm. by several groups along those lines. Now, less well-known is MIC. And it's, it's not shown in any of the big publications, but MIC has been around for quite some time. Looking back, this is Lina Brusso when she was at Anderson, now at Ohio State, and, and Dr. Ho and, uh, and, and us at the, in the team, um, we look at all the cases that have AML with uh, MIC, double minute, and they had either MIC or they had MLL or KMT2A. They were all dead within five months. So this is another one of those high-risk groups. It's not um, appearing in the WHO categories, but the beauty about it, it is that um, you can actually do MIC for immunohistochemistry to identify this. And then I think there are some potential new uh, MIC inhibitors, I yes. believe, right? So. Uh, in the pathway. So this is one where I think uh, morphology could help uh, guide this. And there was one presentation in make, I believe, in Frankfurt with Dr. Hans Michael group, uh, with the, 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 the cytogenetic speaker, I think, talk about make in there. So there, I know the European group is working on this group. So you may see more of it. Take a look at it and do a, a make I, uh, IHC on your cases and see what your experience is. 
in 200 or so cases at Anderson by Ohanian and Dr. Cortez, it does seem to segregate some groups within the, um, with even within the high risk group, the one that had lower mix did better. The one that had higher mix protein did worse. So you could have a tool to segregate within the bad news whether the mix is yes or no. I seen a paper from the group in Moffitt who is also suggesting from the clinical side, and I think it's gonna be published soon if it's not published already, that is having the same findings. So the genomic classification, this is this at least 18 groups. This is one of them, this is divided for you here just so that you can see them, but notice that this is from Papa Emoil in the New England, and notice that out of 1,500 patients, uh, almost 200 either have no driver, no detector, defining class lesions, and no detectable drivers. That's a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. So which means it's either that we don't have the correct tools, or we need better screening, or that we need a, <laughs> we need a better pathology insight into this to help define this group. So molecular is not, is not the answer at all, you know, in all the cases. It's a significant group that is still, um, with the tools that we have to detect, is not, is not being captured. Even though there are 18 groups, they're boils down to at least eight pathways, functional pathways. On the left is FLT3 with the uh, RAS stat, the, the JAK stat, uh, the RAS, uh, and the um, PA3 AKT pathway. The, uh, on the left is the NPM1 pathway, and I don't think Dr. David will show data uh, today, but on the top uh, there is also the uh, tumor suppressor P53 and M NDM2. They're being targeted mm -hmm. MDM2. There's clinical trials going on, in international clinical trials, mm -hmm. uh, trying to restore the, the function of the P53. Um, there is the, um, the transcription factor pathway. And, and down here are the dysregulated and the splicing, the splicing families, the so-called spliceosome complexes, SRSF2, SF3B1, uh, U2, and CR, CR, CRSS2 as well as um, the chromatin modifications. Uh, and here you have the MLLs and the dot one l one which may be related to the MIC pathways that we are seeing in the previous slides. It may be also along those lines. And finally, the DNA methylation, which uh, you will see a lot of data with the IDH2 and IDH1 inhibitors. I think this <laughs> takes us to uh, Dr. David. All right. Uh, so uh, we'll move to my... Uh, Section, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Boyce Ramos. And Dr. Boyce Ramos said it was good to meet old and new friends. <laughs> for me, these are pr pretty much all new friends, except for a couple of people. I don't uh, uh, know many of the pathologists, but it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I work at MD Anderson along with um, Dr. Boyce Ramos. My uh, focus is clinical trials in acute leukemia, specifically in FLT3 and immunotherapy. Uh, we do have a, a, a pretty robust clinical trial platform and now many of these are actually being approved. So uh, we have eight new approvals uh, in acute myeloid leukemia in the last two years. And actually just yesterday, there was a phase three that read out with oral azacitidine maintenance, which was positive. So this will be the ninth one. So it's quite a fantastic uh, pathway of development. It's happening in AML. And we need more, he more help from pathologists, cytogenetics, and molecular. As I will show you, a lot of these depend almost 100% on getting the appropriate molecular cytogenetic data to make the right selection. So historically, what has been the goal of treatment in acute myeloid leukemia? Uh, it has been to achieve a clearance of the disease very rapidly if possible, which we believe is associated with improved survival. And that still is the main overarching goal of treatment. So what we call induction therapy has traditionally been high-dose cytarabine anthracycline, and we use that to try to clear the marrow, and about 75 to 80% of the people were able to do that. And people who get clearance have a better chance, about 50%, 40 to 50% chance of long-term survival, but it is nowhere uh, higher than 40, 50%. Now with the new treatments, the approach is changing. We're moving more towards a continuous suppressive maintenance treatment, very similar to multiple myeloma, but still the goal is to get the bone marrow into remission, traditionally still defined as less than 5%, but with MRD, we're having more and more deeper assessments that are also showing uh, clinical impact. So what about the traditional treatment? We already talked about that. Historically, it's been what we call determining if a patient is fit or unfit. Uh, we're seeing there is more and more movement away from this kind of stratification to a molecular cytogenetic-based stratification so that people who uh, may be considered fit 
uh, if they are eligible towards a particular targeted therapy, we will consider that targeted therapy and vice versa. Somebody who may or may not be unfit based on age, performance, status, comorbidities, we may still consider adding particular targeted or immune therapy. So I think in a few years, we're going to see less and less of this discussion. A few years ago, this was the major discussion who's fit for 3 plus 7 and those who are unfit, we were giving them hypomethylating agents, azacitine, decidabine. Now with the progress with targeted therapies showing that even azacitine, decidabine in some cases can give you equal response rates to the 7 plus 3, the selection is not really based on fitness but more on biology because uh, that is improving outcomes. So here I show you the eight uh, drugs that are approved in AML and a ninth one that's in a uh, related condition to AML, it's not truly AML, called BPDCN, Blastic Plasmacytic Dendritic Neoplasm. I had to try that two, three times before I was able to say it right, so I'm happy we got that. But FLT3 inhibitors are very important. IDH inhibitors are the second important group. Uh, we absolutely 100%, you know, not even 99%, 100% like to know if a person has a FLT3 or an IDH mutation before starting treatment because it significantly, I will show you, impacts the outcome for that patient. Uh, secondary AML, we do have now a therapy called uh, CPX351, which is liposomal uh, cytarabine anthracycline, which has shown in a phase three randomized study survival improvement over standard induction. So we absolutely, again, want to know if somebody has secondary AML. And I'll talk about what we mean by secondary AML. And then probably the most important drug, the, the one that has shown a major breakthrough and will be added to almost all the other things shown here has been menetoclax, especially in combination with hypomethylating agents. We're seeing three times higher response rates than with hypomethylating agent alone and more than double median survival uh, with lower toxicity. So this is really revolutionized therapy. So how do we approach this at MD Anderson? This is kind of a real time 2019 today, if I get a new AML, how I'm thinking. So as you see, the first thing that we want to pick up is acute promyelocytic leukemia. 96% five-year survival. We published recently 200 patient update in blood. Uh, the uh, Italians have done an 800 patient randomized study, also showed 96% five-year survival at triarsenic. So this is the most curable probably of any leukemia or of any cancer maybe. So we don't want to miss it. We don't want to give these people anthracycline, cytarabine, expose them to uh, cytotoxic, genotoxic. So we want to pick that up. The second group is core binding factor. These are people who have inversion 16 or A21 that can be picked up on fish. We request to rush fish for all our new AMLs so that within 48 hours we have these results. In this group, there is a specific drug called gemtuzumab, CD33 antibody that we like to add. Addition of that increases the survival by about 20%, absolute improvement, and we published 150 patient update showing 85% five-year survival with flag ida gemtuzumab. The Germans and the British have also shown very similar 83 to 86%. So you don't want to miss this opportunity to get these people into the 80% cure rate. For the others, we used to say three plus seven. Six years ago, that would have been a reasonable answer. Today, it's not. If you have a FLT3, there's standardized approval based on phase three, adding a FLT3 inhibitor mitostorin. If you have IDH, this is not yet approved or phase three, but there's early data suggesting addition of IDH inhibitor could help. If you have secondary AML without a FLT3 IDH, then adding CPX351 instead of induction has survival benefit. And if you have neither mutation, then potentially adding gemtuzumab or venetoclax. So really, this is personalized therapy. There are six induction therapies that a new, young, acute myeloid leukemia patient could get based on the cytogenetics, the fish, and molecular. And each of these adds anywhere from 10% to 20%, 30% survival benefit. So this is quite critical uh, information for us. Now, even in secondary acute myeloid leukemia, which used to be historically one of the worst groups for outcomes, and it's still a bad group. I will not say it, it's a good group or even intermediate. It's still bad. But with this drug, CPX351, it's less bad. We do have now 25 to 35% of long-term survival compared to 10%. So it's a first step, and we do want to be able to use this. MRD is probably the next big area of research development. Unfortunately, unlike ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, where we have blinatumab, an effective and uh, improving survival MRD eraser, we don't have MRD eraser-like drug in AML, but there are six or seven major trials ongoing, and I think we will find some of these very soon. Okay, so going back to uh, Dr. Boyce Ramos's case, so 
Dr. Vasarama said what happens, we get this patient at MD Anderson, we do the bone marrow usually within a couple of hours, mm -hmm. uh, we uh, call our pathologist uh, lab, we actually try to rush both general pathology, chromosomes, and molecular for all our AML and ALL, uh, and then we are waiting for results. So we get the cellularity, that as I showed you doesn't really help us. What I need to know is FISH for 1517 APL, inversion 16821 core binding factor, FLT3, IDH maybe if I have a trial, and then uh, secondary AML either by FISH, cytogenetic, or history. That's what I need to know. So with just knowing AML, in fact, we are never ever starting therapy, and this is actually a strong recommendation from NCCN and ELN is to not, which is difficult a lot of times in the community, because I give a lot of these uh, lectures and discussions with our community doctors. 10 years ago, the training in big textbooks was the sun should never set on AML. AML, you gotta, it's like appendicitis. You rush in and you treat it right away. And actually, we're now seeing exactly the opposite. If you find the right molecular cytogenetic group and give them the appropriate treatment, the benefit of doing that is more than any loss you could get by waiting three to five days. Now, I said three to five days. I'm not saying we can wait 14 days and 20 days. That's not realistic. But what that means is we now need data quickly. We need to get the data within five days, maybe six days. And again, this is not absolute. If I have somebody with a white count 120,000, rare, but that throws everything out of the window. I have to treat them now. I will add things later. But for the 95%, stable AMLs with some blast, white count below 50, admit them, hydria, fluids, allopurinol. I'm comfortable, in fact, we always wait so we can select the right uh, drug to use. So for these patients, that's what we would do. We would wait, admit him, monitor him, blood transfusion if needed, allopurinol fluid, antibiotics. Then I'm talking to Dr. Boyce Ramos, what does the flow show, what does the uh, morphology shows, and most important, once I get that cytogenetic, showing complex cytogenetics, then I know this is a person, secondary AML, phase three data that I'm gonna show you, showing survival uh, output, and I'm gonna go for the CPX therapy in this case. Now we have trials, CPX single agent is approved, of course, at Anderson, we're trying to see the next frontier, so we have trials of CPX with venetoclax, with gemtuzumab, with FLIT3, et cetera. So we, he may go on a trial in our center in the community, he may go on CPX alone. We usually see that CPX is quite well tolerated. I'll show you the data. The early mortality is less than half of traditional induction chemotherapy, which may also explain why there is some survival benefit in addition to its own efficacy. Most people by day 30 start recovering their counts. We admit them inpatient. We monitor them closely for infections and treat them. Most of them do require a course of IV antibiotics. And usually by day 34, 35, we're seeing complete remission being achieved in about 50% of the patients. So not all, but that's actually better than three plus seven, which gave about 30 to 35%. I'm gonna show you some of the data, why we like CPX351 in this specific setting, people who have what we call secondary AML or MRC-associated AML. So what is CPX351? So this is actually not a targeted therapy in the way that we think of targeted therapies like FLT3 and EGFR inhibitors, et cetera. It is not a immunotherapy either, neither antibody drug conjugate, uh, or a bispecific, it's actually a, mo a novel formulation of cytotoxic therapy in a liposomal packet, which has been shown to be associated with less toxicity, less dissemination in the other organs, and more potent uh, selection into the bone marrow and blast, which is, of course, what we like, and preclinically was very exciting, but that's not what will get the drug approved or people to start using it. So the phase one, two, three data uh, is shown here. We don't need to go through the whole details. It was important that in the phase two, when we used all AML, it was not that we went to secondary AML right away based on some preclinical component. We actually treated all AML. And when we did a subset analysis, as we often do in these studies, we found that among the different cytogenetic molecular de novo secondary stratifications, it was a secondary AML who had the most survival benefit. The de novo also had some benefit, but it was not as profound. So after a lot of discussions and investigator meetings, et cetera, we finally said we should go where we see the benefit, not try to take a risk for the entire population. And this study was designed. So this was a phase three randomized multinational clinical trial where patients would get, who were known to have C, uh, secondary AML, and how do we define secondary AML? So there were three groups that could go into this is the, probably the easy way to think about it. So people with known therapy-related AML, your lung cancer patient who had Taxol, your breast cancer patient who had anthracycline, <coughs> lymphoma patient, whatever. So we know from history 
they had a known prior malignancy, got chemo and or radiation therapy. Now AML, this is therapy related AML, easy ones to pick up by history. Second is people with a known history of MDS uh, with or without prior hypomethylating therapy. Also very easy. You talk to the patient, he said, I had MDS two years ago. I've been on Procrit growth factor. Now I have AML based on your bone marrow, secondary AML. The third one is probably the one that is very hard even today, and it's improving, to be picked up because these are people who have no known history of MDS, antecedent hematological diseases, or prior chemo radiation therapy, and now they come in with new AML. You did the bone marrow. Five years ago, we would just give them seven plus three, maybe FLIT3 IDH, we would check that. Today, if these people have deletion 17, deletion five, deletion seven, uh, Dr. Boyce Ramos showed you the big list. Uh, sometimes I don't think I have it memorized. Maybe he has it memorized. That's why I wait for him to tell me. But we know the big ones, the common ones, right? The complex carrier types, the MLL, et cetera. Then we start thinking in some of these that this could be secondary ML. And this is important because in the subset analysis, each of these groups independently had survival benefit with the CPX351. So you don't want to miss that patient and five or 10 days later find out, oh, he's actually having a secondary AML associated uh, MDS cytogenetics. And why? Because here you see the survival data. So as I said, this is not a home run yet, but it's a first step, hopefully, to many combinations that are going to be built on this. And we do see in this very, very bad risk group where the historical survival was 15 to 18 percent. Many large studies have actually shown this, including from our group. We are now getting at least up to 35, 40 percent, and there is a nice separation that has been maintained at three years and beyond in these survival curves. So we do think there's a real overall survival. As you see at the bottom bar, there was also a response benefit for complete remission with complete remission in complete recovery of 48 versus 33. So more than 50% improved response rate, which is quite good. And then here, this is the slide that I really like because now if we know he has secondary AML, we can give him CPS351. We want to transplant all these people. If we can get them to transplant in remission, which CPX gives you a better chance, you're talking about potential 50% and higher survival. So this is not now a completely nihilistic group. Uh, so we want to not miss that opportunity. The point being made here is that in people above 60 where this drug was approved, some said, well, this is still cytotoxic therapy, which it indeed is, uh, and I don't want to give it above 70 because I'm worried, I'm concerned, the benefit will be lost. So we did a subset analysis. We saw that it didn't matter 60 to 69 or 70 above. There was a maintained survival benefit in those populations, and there's no reason I would not consider it in a person up to 75. Of course, you have to look at comorbidities and organ function, uh, et cetera. Importantly, we see that the early mortality, as you can see, is almost reduced by half with the CPX351. And large part of that is probably because of the mucositis being lower than we see with anthracycline. And that's what's shown here again, that the 60-day uh, mortality is 10 to 11% compared to 22%. We still consider this, as I said, cytotoxic therapy. They get mucositis, lower extent, but they do get it. Neutropenic fever is still common. IV antibodies required. So we usually treat these people in patients. This is not targeted uh, molecular therapy that we could do it outpatient, but it's a better form of delivering a cytotoxic therapy with more efficacy. Okay, so moving from that case to uh, another important molecular stratified case, this is a FLIT3 case. So this is a, a very, very, very important uh, group of patients because we now have multiple FLIT3 inhibitors that are probably all going to be used eventually, like in CML, in different sequences. And I think this will really, really improve the survival of these patients to 80% or beyond, which is what we're already starting to see in some of our trials. So this patient comes in, a high white count to some extent, has high bone marrow blast. Again, I call Dr. Boyce Ramos. Let's rush, please, the fish, the cytogenetics, the flow, the morphology. Uh, what we have is two molecular panels. We have what we call a rapid molecular panel, which gives us 10 genes that are actionable. So your FLT3, your NPM1, your IDH1 and 2, your TP53, CBPA, RAS, and a few others. That comes to us in 72 hours, and I don't start treatment in most patients before doing that. Mm -hmm. Then we have the big 81 gene research panel, you know, help we look at it retrospectively, try to find what's the impact of Sybil and what's the impact of EZH and all these publications keep coming. But in 72 hours, we usually are trying hard to get our fish, get our morphology, get the molecular. And a lot of people say, oh, this is MD Anderson only. Actually, it's not. So in fact, here the Europeans, I have to really uh, commend, and the German group especially is amazing. So they have a lab, centralized labs, 
where the whole country of Germany, I was there for a couple of talks last year, within 72, in fact, 48 hours, are getting molecular testing. So this can be done in a nationalized scale. Australia, it's about 70 to 96 hours. England is getting now below five days. So this is actually happening in nationalized uh, systems, of course, with a lot of effort. All this takes years, years, and somebody championing it very hard, but, but it's actually happening. And in the U.S., most academic centers have about a three to five day turnaround. In the community, it's improving, but we're still uh, not getting it seven to eight days, not below that, but it'll improve. So this person got a, a what we call a standard induction, seven plus three with the mitostorin, which is a FLT3 inhibitor, also called Ratify, had a re response, 80%, 75 to 80% people achieve a remission, uh, with this therapy, CR plus CRI combined. And in this person, you want to take them to transplant. Now, unfortunately, even after you do everything, about 25, 30% may relapse. And for that, we have other FLT3 inhibitors being developed in the relapse that are also quite active. So we're going to start thinking about those. So these are all the FLT3 inhibitors. So quite a exciting time. As you can see, we, we have one already frontline approved two others approved, one in the United States, a drug called girtritinib, very potent second-generation FLT3 inhibitor, and a second one, quizartinib, which got approved in Japan, I think it was last month, in fact, and hopefully will also make it into the United States in the near future based on a couple of other ongoing studies. And then others that are not approved, but we have used a lot in the past, like sorofenib, because they were available for lung, uh, for renal, and for hepatocellular, and pranolinib. So we have a lot of options, so we have to start selecting. This is a, uh, a slide that I like because it kind of shows you in summary the major three FLT3 inhibitor trials. So one of them is a trial called the Ratify Frontline Study that got the approval of the drug, 750 patient study randomized to mitostorin with 7 plus 3 or 7 plus 3 survival advantage. The two others are the girtritinib, quizartinib. These both were single agents in salvage and showed the benefit. So we're going to not spend too much detail. These have all been published in, in major journals. This was in New England Journal. One can look at the details. But the design here was I get a new AML patient. I send the bone marrow. I need to know, is he FLT3 mutated? I found out in four days, five days, three days, he's FLT3 mutated. Then he was randomized to get either 3 plus 7, which is what we were doing for the last 25, 30 years, or we do the same and add the FLT3 inhibitor that we thought from phase 1 to had sh was going to improve their outcome. And then the patients could get the same FLT3 inhibitor during consolidation and maintenance. And uh, the maintenance was, I think, quite an important part of this. And we use maintenance actually in all our TKI studies, just like in CML, ALL, with the uh, ponatinib, the satinib, et cetera. And these were the outcomes. So initially, when we saw three, uh, three and a half years ago, Dr. Stone uh, presenting this data, people saw the survival curve. Eh, it's OK. I mean, sure, it was the first drug actually that got approved. So people are excited. Something is positive. P-value is good, okay, it's not a major breakthrough, but it's a stepping stone, the drug got approved. To me, again, just like the uh, CPX, and this is a theme emerging, the total therapy is what's needed, not single agent. If you take a FLT3 mutated patient, you give them mitostorin, and you take them to transplant, that's the curve I like. So now you're talking about 70% survival at five years. I didn't show you because it's not a FLT3 dedicated talk, but 18 years ago, Froelig and colleagues from Germany first showed the impact of FLT3, 800 patients, 200 had FLT3. The established survival in FLT3 ITD five year was 24%. If you can go and randomize phase three, this is not major academic centers, this was 100 centers all across the world. Some were big, some were not so big. And they could all show 75% with transplant. So this is quite revolutionary. This is what we tell our patients today. If I get a patient below 65, I can give him FLT3 inhibitor, transplant him, I'm thinking 70 plus. In fact, now we're using post-transplant maintenance that was presented at ASH last year that is further showing uh, advantage. So really revolutionized the outcome for these populations. What was important uh, also to pathologists is that FLT3 is not a uh, standalone. It's not just FLT3 yes, FLT3 no. If you look at the ELN that Dr. Boyce Ramos showed, FLT3 was in all three categories. It was in favorable, it was in intermediate, it was unfavorable. So if all I get to know, and in the community, this is a problem, which is hopefully is starting to improve, FLT3 positive, it actually doesn't give me any information. He could be a FLT3 low with an NPM1 mutated, that's favorable. He could be a FLT3 high with an NPM wild type, that's unfavorable. He could be a FLT3 positive and an NPM1 mutated with FLT3 high, he's intermediate. So what do I need to know? I need to know the allelic ratio, or frequency, depending on your lab, and I need to know NPM1 at least 
It's not even that easy. In fact, if you have DNMT3A, as Dr. Boyce Ramos showed, even if your allele is low, you could be do very bad. So this field is going to be a little bit complicated. Lung cancer is also kind of getting this way that you need to know co-mutations and you need to know allelic ratios, and it's not going to be just one you know, mutation, yes, mutation, no. What else is important? This is clinically extremely important, and I think probably the pathologists also are going to get the same question from their clinicians. So people will say, I gave 3 plus 7 mitostorin uh, in 2016. The person did well. He went to transplant. He relapsed two years later in 2018. I'm going to go and give him giltritinib or quizartinib uh, because these are approved in Europe and Japan. No, you cannot do that. Why? Look at the data here. So these were people who got 3 plus 7 mitostorin and relapsed, and then we repeated in a handful. We didn't have all the samples, but in this group of about 70 patients or 60 patients, we had some samples, and we showed that a number of them, almost 40% were FLT3 non-detectable at relapse. Were they true negative? Was the sensitivity? That's an argument. We don't know. But if your FLT3 is below 3% or 5%, it's not the driver most likely. So the point here is I would not treat those people who did not have a detectable FLT3 with giltritinib. I would look at other options. We have other therapies. So you have to check FLT3 at relapse. The reverse is true. Our group had published six years ago. There are some people who have no detectable FLT3 at baseline. They relapse. 10 to 15% acquire FLT3. So the right thing to do is before you start a relapse FLT3 inhibitor, you need to know if the FLT3 is still positive or if somebody acquired a FLT3 and now maybe giltritinib or quizartinib are good options. We don't see the same for IDH. It's a more stable clone. FLT3 is a more fluctuant clone. So this is some of the data with uh, one of the other FLT3 inhibitors, quizartinib in the salvage. Quite an important study, uh, even though the survival advantage is not good. What are we comparing here? We're comparing oral, pill, single agent, to three-drug IV chemotherapy, FLAG, IDA, or MEC. If I was a patient, even if you told me these are equal, actually, even if you told me quizartinib is a little bit inferior, I may say, if you're giving me oral therapy versus 20-day hospital mucositis, infection, nausea, I'm going for the pill. This was actually not powered for inferiority or equivalence. It was powered for superiority, and it actually met that. Now, in the end of the day, this will all be used in combination, so we think it's a good step. The same with the giltritinib also showed as a single agent relapse AML, it was overpowering, almost doubling the response rates of three drug potent IV chemotherapy. Quite, quite fascinating. We don't actually see this that much in solid tumor where the oral agent completely beats three or four drug IV chemotherapy. So this is quite nice. The drug is approved. Again, you see post-transplant, if you continue to use it, you have a better survival outcome. And most importantly, both of these are being used upfront with induction as well as with hypomethylating agents, and I think that's where we're going to see the real impact. Uh, this is regulatory approval ways to get it with a single agent. We never really think any single agent in AML is going to change the landscape dramatically, but it will be combined. Another important thing here was presented at ASCO two, three months ago by Dr. Levis, one of our FLIT3 experts. Uh, he's from Hopkins, and showed that it didn't matter. I remember I told you it matters what your co-mutation is for the prognosis. But it didn't matter what your commutation was for the impact of the FLT3 inhibitor. So people who had an NPM1 commutation, people who had a um, you know, WT1 commutation, all of them benefited from giltritinib. So for therapy, you can use it. We are now looking at a number of other important pathways. So the story is really just beginning, which sounds crazy after nine drug approvals, but I really think this is the truth. Now we're going to actually start having the ability to do all these cool combinations, which scientifically show that we should improve the outcome. And we know very well a major mechanisms of resistance to FLT3, and all of these combos are actually in clinic in phase one, two setting. And in the end, I'm going to say briefly about the IDH inhibitors. These are both approved. These were both used in salvage setting. Both of these were single agents, but were compared to very robust historical controls. One was actually from our group and showed that they outperformed high-dose chemotherapy in the IDH population and they're extremely safe. So the FDA actually approved them on single arm 200 patient study using a prospect uh, um, uh, historical control in the contemporary time period. And we think that they are great drugs, but again, combining them with HMAs, combining them upfront is probably gonna be the most important step. The big conclusion here really is that the field is changing dramatically. It's fantastic, uh, you know, and it's gonna continue to change because the more drugs, the more combinations, the more doublets, triplets. So that's the progress. Of course, to do all this, we need extremely high support and collaboration with our pathologists. As Dr. Boyce Ramos says, we meet once a week, but we talk by email or phone 
10 times a day mm -hmm. for each patient. Like you said, you know, yesterday we're getting emails from some of our leukemia colleagues. And I think this cohesion is extremely critical because these drugs are only as good as the ability to select the right patients to give them. So if we cannot know the right patient and we cannot know it in a timely manner, yes. then we don't get the benefit, even though the drug may look great in some study. Uh, also, some of these high-risk groups, like FLT3, which is high risk, I don't really know if it's high risk. If I can give 75%, which I can, and this is what our data is showing, which will be published next year, into these patients, that's not high risk anymore. So the ability of these targeted therapies, when appropriately identified and given, is to transform what was high risk to a standard, and I actually bet you in the future, favorable, and we're seeing this with Philadelphia Positive ALL. It was bad 15 years ago, it became neutral. Now, in fact, if a patient has it, you give him ponatinib, 80% survival. It's better to have it than to not have it. So with that, I will stop, and happy to take any questions and answers. Okay. okay. Thank you. We have some good questions here. Yeah. Uh, should we uh, be reporting FLT3 allelic ratios in all cases, Dr. Dunn? Yes, ideally, yes, we should. And, and as I said, you know, the people who have the high allelic ratio, especially in the absence of an NPM1 mutation, are clearly unfavorable. The goal is to get them to transplant. Uh, more importantly, and we cannot make a clear statement, but I think in a year we'll have the data, is people who have low allelic ratio and an NPM1 mutation. So in those people, I would give a FLT3 inhibitor. I showed you that uh, bar graph. But the real question is, would I transplant that patient? Because these people may be like core binding factor. The NPM1 mutated, FLT3 low allelic ratio. I'm giving a FLT3 inhibitor. We have some data already showing these people could do very well or as well without transplant. So I think as this data starts coming out, it's going to be important. Yeah. So there is another question here for you. Are there any updates on the um, um, FLT3 ITD mutants are based on how often is repeated. Uh, testing uh, typically necessary. So yeah, that's what we discussed. Is that mm -hmm. yeah, we would we would uh, repeat it at all relapse time points uh, at mm -hmm. least to select the therapy. Now, uh, in being an academic center, we do it at every time point actually because we follow the FLT3 PCR and we're trying to identify with whether PCR eradication is associated with improved outcome. And it actually seems to be. So if you can do it every time point, great. But if not, at least at the time point of changing therapy. Uh, I think you want to check it so you don't miss something. Do you see cases of AMLMRC without prior MDS? That's a great question, absolutely. Um, so we're, we're seeing um, a number of uh, cases. I would say almost 50% of our patients who are becoming eligible for the CPX351 are patients who don't have a history of MDS mm -hmm. or therapy-related AML. Okay. Uh, so yeah, okay. very important group, um, yeah. Okay. Dr. Horace, you, you had a question? A comment? Yeah. Here we go. Okay, right there. Thank you very much. No, excellent presentation. My question is very simple. Uh, you show secondary AML, but you did not include blastic phase or myeloproliferative disease. Do we have good news in those as well? <laughs> no, that's a sad answer. Unfortunately, all these trials uh, and excluded both the blastic phase, both the VIX CPX and the ASA venetoclax. And in the ASA venetoclax, we have data that will be presented soon that unfortunately venetoclax does not work well in the blastic phase. Maybe BCL-XL inhibition, not BCL2, could be good preclinically, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, we are doing things like HMA, hypomethylating with RUX, median survival is 10 months, and that is probably, between TP53 and that, I don't know which is worse, and they go together often, those are probably the two most horrible groups, yeah. So I think it highlights Dr. Horace's emphasis too. Please don't call AML without saying that this is a blast phase of AML because it's a different, complete animal. From MPNs, it's a, it's a completely yeah. different mm -hmm. animal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, do uh, do you have uh, any use for next generation sequencing as part of the baseline um, diagnostic assessment? Do you always use next generation sequencing? I, I you yeah. know, I think I show you the data and the diagram. Yes, we always do. We even expedited it. So basically what Patel does is he goes, uh, you know, in one read and he releases a preliminary on the computational data set. So he releases a preliminary on the hit, on the and then the second read, uh, you know, confirms that these are really the mutation, that, but, but that allows him to pull a preliminary quick read. And then, uh, I don't know if Dr. Logabi would like to comment on that. Do you have a, a comment on the preliminary molecular? Do Mike. you have a please for Dr. Logabi? 
you saw where one of our molecular experts are Anderson, yeah. the preliminary panel for next generation. Yeah, so yep. we have 10 genes that we report um, basically within 48 hours. Mm -hmm. We can turn yes. that around within 48 hours. Among those, we have NPM1 because basically it, um, it's a diagnostic category, With right? It changes the diagnosis. Um, IDH1 and IDH2 because of the reasons that you alluded to because it changes therapy. We have some yep. MPN-related genes including JAK2, right. uh, MIPL, and calreticulin because again, they affect diagnosis. Um, and then um, we have SRSF2 mm. and SF3B1. Thank you for this excellent uh, uh, talk. I have uh, just a question concerning uh, the overexpression of uh, MIC protein that you showed by immunohistochemistry. Mm -hmm. chemistry. Is this identical with the uh, break in the MIC gene or with MIC amplification? Because in lymphoma, it's not identical if you stay uh, in lymphoma is, Yeah, cases. so good question. Uh, only a subset, most of them are amplified. They were double menus. Where, with, where within the homogeneous stain in re region. And so um, there was one early case that I think it was the early hit and it was a rearrangement. And that was also reported by Lina Bruso on one of the heme oncologists. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think there is a story devolving in MIC and it, in that one, when it's one hit, it behaves very aggressively because that patient died very quickly and created a lot of problems diagnostically for us because the sample was fibrotic at that time and, and so on. So there are multiple pathways that are leading to, um, I think there are, there are some other ways by which MIC is deregulated uh, that I think we need um, to, we look at RNA um, overexpression or, and so the data related to the rest of what deregulate MIC is still unknown. But you can look at the, uh, I think the, the, the group in um, Florida, what's his name, the Moffitt group, uh, is, is coming up with a detailed publication on the group of discussed today, mm -hmm. MRMRCs, and I think that will lead some, um, some more insights into the mechanism. Uh, should we include uh, MIC immunohistochemistry uh, in the uh, AML uh, panel? if we, uh, we have enough money to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's recommended yet because yet. we don't have enough data. We need to have more uh, published data to yeah. be um, recommended, but we are doing it. Yeah, Very so here's a question. Uh, so this is uh, Dr. Daver, how often do you and Dr. Boyce Ramos consult when managing a given AML patient? So we're actually consulting on the phone right now, I heard <laughs> Carlos is emailing me. No, but we, we email, I mean, it's not always Dr. Boyce Ramos, mm -hmm. Could be Dr. Logavi, Wang, mm -hmm. uh, Konoplev. We have a, a group of hempath and group of leukemia. But I would say, you know, for every patient, at least at the beginning, to get a rush, and then at least one or two more time points, uh, we will review it. Um, sometimes more if it's a more complicated patient. So very close communication and email is a blessing and a curse in that way. So. Yeah, but it is very close. And, and the MR, MRD, I will get an email from Dr. Sawan. He says, Carlos, <laughs> I don't think that's still positive. I think it's negative, you know? So I have to go to her office and review the flow and the MRD and apologize if I miss something, or vice versa. The, the lower it gets and the more detailed, the more um, your report is now integrated with some MRDs by flow and by, um, by molecular. And yeah. so. It's just a matter of uh, in integrating and, you know, I guess learning to be, um, you know, humble at that time. You get quite uh, humble very quickly. Yeah. And one of the other last, <laughs> I'm going to do the last question here um, about, you know, somebody's any advice on how to replicate the comprehensive MD Anderson diagnostic model at a busy community center. Uh, as I said, nationalized groups um, with a very, uh, you know, centralized focus and a lot of efforts have done this. Actually, foundation medicine, neogenomics, gene optics, you name it, we've actually worked and had a lot of them come and give meetings. They can turn these around in 48 to 72 hours, but they need somebody to call them and they need it to be rushed. If you send a normal panel, it takes 14, 21 days. But if you need a FLIT3, if you need an IDH, somebody in that clinic or the heme path group or the physician assistant, whoever calls it, they say in 48 hours they will give the results. So uh, part of this is just, I guess, the push and the effort uh, that it's actually uh, will get it done. It's not that the technology mm -hmm. is lacking or missing. And if Dr. Daver's clinic did not suspect a relapse, and we see the diff with increased blast, and I see that they did not order molecular, I, as soon as the flow finishes, I immediately we reflect that immediately with the molecular lab, so that the patient gets captured and we notify them. That way, we you know we expedite the next assessment for the next targeted round. Yeah. So that requires just an email, uh, you know, with the tools now with Epic Sync. I think uh, you will get more okay. functionalities to communicate this in, in a real time. Absolutely, yeah.
But thank okay. you. To, you've been a fantastic audience. Thank you yeah. for coming. Thank and you your all time. very much. Thank okay. you. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash YCF 860. This activity is supported by educational grants from Foundation Medicine Incorporated and Jazz Pharmaceuticals Incorporated.